पवित्र चरत पवित्र जीवन तथा पवित्रतास्वरूपिण्य तस्मो नमो नम So friends today we will look at some pilgrimage sites that are associated with the holy mother and like last week it will be in two parts we will first look at some established sites uh, i mean which were pilgrimage sites which the holy mother visited and then in the second part we will look at some places that became holy for us because Uh, holy mother was there <clears throat> so we we looked last week into why one needs to go on a pilgrimage and we also discussed why sri ramakrishna went on a pilgrimage or pilgrimages but interestingly or ironically uh if we look at the first pilgrimage of the holy mother which was in 1886 um uh, she was born in 1853 so about 33 years of age when she went on her first pilgrimage you can say none of the reasons that were cited for sri ramakrishna's pilgrimage applied here why do i say that well the first reason for her pilgrimage was the maha samadhi of uh, thakur sri ramakrishna so as we know august 15th 1886 uh, holy mother had some premonitions she herself uh, said that well uh, when she was making khichdi um, khichdi is that li- rice and lentil uh, mixture that we have Uh, for many events here when she was making khichdi uh, the bottom part of it got burned so they had to discard that part they couldn't eat it um, she uh, put out a sari of hers to line dry and that was stolen so she saw them as very bad omens and indeed uh, that turned out to be the case because at 1 am 1 or 2 am august 16th 1886 uh, shri ramakrishna left his physical frame and uh, that as you can imagine created a deep depression not only among holy mother but many other disciples shri ramakrishna's presence was so magnetic that even though he was suffering from throat cancer and even though uh, his activities were were becoming very very limited Uh, the passing away of his became uh, a deep deep uh, uh, hit it was a deep hit to uh, many uh, m- and, and uh, to holy mother much more so than the others because uh, we have to keep in mind this is 1886 uh, hindu customs at that time were very regressive she being the widow of sri ramakrishna she had to uh, face some additional humiliation like uh, she could wear only a white sari with a very very thin border um she i mean hindu uh, bengali hindu women wear um, some bracelets uh, which uh, upon the passing of their husbands they need to go to the banks of a river and kind of break it so uh, extremely humiliating and uh, holy mother uh, did go to do that but then uh, sri ramakrishna appeared before her and uh, kind of admonished her and said why are you doing this where have i gone i have just moved from one room to another so that did uh, provide some satisfaction but again uh, the, the loss of uh, sri ramakrishna was indeed very um stressful uh, now to add to that what happened was when uh, shri ramakrishna passed away in the kashipur garden house after that there was you can say uh, the, the, there appeared two factions uh, the senior faction if you, uh, if you would like to call that 
the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna who were the financiers who were renting the Kashipur house and who were um, uh, paying for all the supplies, um, Ram Dotto being the main one, they felt that now that Thakur had passed away, there was no reason for them to rent this house and they wanted the, the, the later on to become monks, the young disciples, to go back to their homes and they wanted the relics of the Thakur. There were some relics, we'll, we'll talk about that. They wanted them to be installed in um, Ram Dotto's um, uh, land, which used to be called, and still is today called, Kakurgachi Jogoddan. Uh, so, but the young disciples, they wanted to maintain a common establishment. They wanted to uh, pray with the Thakur's relics, so there were some, uh, we will not get into the details, the, the, it, it wasn't a pleasant sight at all uh, for the Holy Mother. Now, once this um, Kashipur house uh, was not available anymore, then of course the question came, where would Holy Mother stay? So there was no permanent home and Balaram Bose um, did uh, invite her to his house and she did uh, go uh, from uh, Kashipur Garden House to Balaram Bosch's house, uh, but um, again, as you can imagine, the, she couldn't really live there permanently. And even this uh, trip from Kashipur Garden House to Balaram Bosch's house was very traumatic because what happened is Balaram Bosch uh, brought a carriage and she mounted the carriage, and as that carriage was about to leave the premises of the garden house, the sentry, the, the kind of the gatekeeper, he demanded the unpaid rent. And so it was a very messy situation, as you can imagine. But there was one more reason, and that is Sri Ramakrishna did uh, instruct or wish Holy Mother that she should go on pilgrimages because uh, Thakur said that, pointing to his body, this uh, has not been able to go to many places, so you should visit as many as you can. So, um, within a couple of weeks uh, of the Mahasamadhi of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother went on her first pilgrimage. And her destination for the initially was Banaras, but as we have seen, um, Sri Ramakrishna first went to Baidyanath Dham in Deoghar, so on the way to Banaras, Holy Mother also went there and stayed there for one night. And then the party, the party means this was um, Holy Mother, uh, Thakur's niece, Lokhi, Lakshmi, um, M, uh, Master Mahasha, the chronicler of the gospel, uh, his wife, not M, but his wife Nikunjo Devi, um, uh, Latu Maharaj Swami, Adbhutananda, uh, Kali Maharaj Swami Abhedananda and uh, Jogin Maharaj Swami Yogananda and uh, um, uh, Golapma. So this party then went to Banaras and they stayed in Banaras for about 10 days and as we have seen Banaras is the place of Shiva so uh, no wonder that Holy Mother visited the Vishwanath temple in Banaras uh, multiple times and uh, as again uh, we saw last week Banaras also at that time and even today happened to be the place where many sadhus um, lived so at that time 1886 there was a very famous sadhu Swami Bhaskarananda so Holy Mother wanted to visit and meet Swami Bhaskarananda but there was a problem and the problem was that Swami Bhaskarananda did not wear any clothing. Now, as you can imagine, Holy Mother, um, uh, she was so shy, so bashful that um, many people have never really seen her face. It was always behind the veil. And so uh, kind of unobtrusive were her acts that in Dakshineshwar, the treasurer, the Khajanchi of the Dakshineshwar temple, when he was asked, he said, yes, I have heard that Sri Ramakrishna's wife stays in the Nahabot 
but I have never seen her. So now for Holy Mother <laughs> to see this person, Swami Bhaskaranda, whom she desperately wanted to meet, it was, as you can imagine, a little troublesome. So let's just read from uh, Sri Sarada Devi and her divine play, this wonderful book by Swami Chetanananda. And this is page 153. So another day, Holy Mother and others went. So finally, they, they did decide to go. Uh, went to pay their respects to Swami Bhaskarananda, a well-known holy man who, ha who remained completely naked as part of his spiritual practices. When he met them, and he could see <laughs> the faces of these uh, devotees. So when he met them, the Swami said, Don't feel nervous, mothers. You are all manifestations of the Divine Mother of the universe. Why should you be embarrassed? Is it because of my genital organ? Why? It is like one of my fingers. Holy Mother said later, What a calm, great soul. He always remains naked in winter and summer alike. So, uh, this very inspiring meeting, and then um, there were some other incidents that happened, but uh, we will move on. Um, so, from Banaras, uh, the party went to Ayodhya. Ayodhya, as you know, is the birthplace of Sri Rama, and uh, Banaras is, of course, on the banks of the Ganga, Ayodhya is on the banks of the Saryu River. So um, there are many, many temples dotting the, the banks of the Saryu. And Holy Mother also took um, a, a dip in the Saryu. But she was there only for one day or so. And then again back to Banaras and then to Vrindavan. And uh, on the way to Vrindavan, something very interesting happened. Again, let's read from Swami Chetanananda's book. This is page 155. The next day the party left for Vrindavan. In the train, on the way, Holy Mother had a vision of Ramakrishna. She was then wearing the master's gold amulet on one of her arms. In the train, she lay down with her arm on the window sill, leaving the amulet visible. The master suddenly appeared and said to her through the window, Hello, why are you wearing the amulet that way? A thief could easily snatch it. Immediately she got up, removed the amulet for, from her arm and put it in a small trunk where she kept the master's photo. She realized that the master was always with her, protecting her. She never wore that amulet again. Instead, she worshipped it every day and later she gave it to the Belur Mutt for the Master's Shrine. Okay? So, you see how, uh, how many times Sri Ramakrishna came to her uh, within this short time. I mean, this is about a month after the Mahasamadhi. But when we go to Vrindavan today, uh, the place that is most... Uh, associated with the Holy Mother is known as Kala Babu's Kunjo. Uh, it is actually uh, Balram Bose's family's house. This is on the banks of the Yamuna. And um, Holy Mother used to take long walks along the banks of the Yamuna. This is the room where she stayed, the, the left. And the right is as it is today. And uh, uh, Holy Mother stayed in Vrindavan for a long time, 10, 11 months. So, as you can imagine, there were many, many divine uh, plays, leelas. Um, I'll, I'll just mention couple. Uh, page 156. So, in, in Vrindavan, there is this tradition of circumambulating this whole town, okay? So, orthodox Vaishnavas circumambulate Vrindavan in bare feet and visit the spots connected with Krishna's life. As we have seen uh, last week, Vrindavan is Braj Bhumi, 
Krishna's Leela divine act, um, uh, sight of many divine acts of Krishna. So, uh, um, Holy Mother and her party followed this tradition. It took them 15 days. Holy Mother closely observed the banks of the Yamuna, the groves, trees, temples, mendicants, and the scenic views of Vraja. Vraja is the place, it's called Vraja Bhumi. From time to time, she stopped and could not go on. Yoginma guessed that Holy Mother was having divine visions. When she asked Holy Mother why she had stopped, Holy Mother kept quiet and only said, let us go. Swami Yogananda has left a vivid account of Holy Mother's stay in Vrindavan. So we will read, read a couple of uh, paragraphs. At Vrindavan, Holy Mother had many spiritual experiences. One day, her women companions found her absorbed in deep samadhi. They uttered the name of the Lord in her ears and tried to bring her mind down. I, I meaning Yogananda Maharaj, Swami Yogananda. I repeated the name of Sri Ramakrishna with all my strength. At that, the mother seemed to return to the ordinary sense plane. During such periods of ecstasy, her manner of speech, her voice, her way of taking food, her way of walking, and her general behavior were exactly like those of the Master. We have heard that in deep meditation, the worshipper and the worshipped become one. The scriptures mention a spiritual state known as Tadatmya Bhava, being at one with God. We have read in the Bhagavata how the gopis, unable to bear separation from Krishna, became so deeply absorbed in the thought of him that for the moment they forgot their own individualities and behaved as though they were Krishna. In the same manner, Holy Mother too forgot her own separate existence and acted just like the Master, feeling her oneness with him. When I asked her some complex questions about spiritual matters, shortly after her states of samadhi, she replied from a God-intoxicated mood, very much like Sri Ramakrishna, that is in the same manner, characteristic of the Master, even using his same easy style of expression with metaphors and parables. So you can see how complete this identification of the Holy Mother was with, um, with the Master. So in Vrindavan, there was also one more very important uh, event, and that uh, is, uh, you can say, the starting of her spiritual ministry. Now, as we know, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he initiated, we, we don't know the real count, but I think it is less than 100, cannot be more than 100. But Holy Mother initiated literally thousands, okay, in all places, uh, Udbodhan, Joy Rambati, um, even on a railway platform, we, we have heard the story of uh, Holy Mother traveling from Joy Rambati to uh, Kolkata and in, in the station, uh, a person comes, wants to be initiated. She sits on the railway platform and initiates them. So, uh, but this um, ministry, it started with actually Swami Yogananda. What happened was that this is during her stay in Vrindavan, uh, Sri Ramakrishna appeared before her and instructed her to initiate Swami Yogananda. So Holy Mother said, how is that possible? So first time this, uh, this vision came, she kind of ignored it. But then as you can imagine, Sri Ramakrishna is not going to let this go by. So he appeared again. And then Holy Mother said, well, how can I do this? I mean, I keep in mind, Holy Mother still was in a veil all the time she was in the public. So she said to Sri Ramakrishna, well, I have never even spoken to Yogananda. Um, I have never initiated anybody. How is this possible? So Thakur said, no, you have to. And Thakur also gave the mantra. Now, okay, the mantra is given, but then how to, um, how to approach Yogananda? So then it was decided that Golapma would talk to Yogananda. And strangely enough, 
in Yogananda's dream also Thakur appeared and said, you have to take initiation from the Holy Mother. So now there was of course no obstacle. So that is how um, Holy Mother gave her first initiation to Swami Yogananda and um, she was so absorbed spiritually at that time that uh, Golabma could even hear the initiation mantra. Typically the tradition is that when you give the initiation mantra you kind of whisper in the ear of the uh, initiate but Holy Mother at that time was kind of in a very ecstatic state. So that began her spiritual ministry. Okay. So from Vrindavan, uh, the party went to Hardwar. Hardwar um, is again a very important pilgrimage site in the Hindu tradition. Um, this is also on the banks of the Ganges, uh, but at a little higher elevation. This is still the foothills. Typically, when we uh, when Hindus go on some very important pilgrimages like the Char Dham, um, it's you, you can say this is the base camp. So you you go to Hardwar, then uh, from Hardwar to Rishikesh, that's where most of these ashramas are, the yoga ashramas and the uh, sadhu ashramas, uh, spiritual organization ashramas, and from Rishikesh then you start climbing up the Himalayas. So this is still the plains, uh, Hardwar, and uh, there is this place called Brahmakund, very very um, pious place for uh, uh, holy Hindus. So this is where Holy Mother, she had brought with her Sri Ramakrishna's hair and nail clippings and this is where she immersed them. Okay. So then the party went to Rajasthan and uh, in Rajasthan there is a very famous place called Pushkar and Pushkar is basically a lake and it is dotted with um, many, many temples around the lake. The most important of them being, being the Brahma temple. It so happens that for some mythological reasons, we have so many Vishnu temples, we have so many Shiva temples, we have but only one Brahma temple. And that is in Pushkar. So you can imagine its importance. It's actually not Brahma's temple. It is Savitri, the wife of Brahma's. But anyway, so Holy Mother also went, uh, took a dip in this Pushkar lake and went to the Savitri temple. And from there, they went to Allahabad again, uh, as we have seen last week, uh, Sri Ramakrishna also visited Allahabad, so Holy Mother did so as well. And at this Prayag, this is the confluence of Ganga and Yamuna, she also immersed some of Sri Ramakrishna's hair, which she had carried with her. And then the party, after about a year, uh, from um, August 1886 to August 1887, so the one year they spent on all these pilgrimages, after one year they returned to Kol Kolkata. So the next pilgrimage that she took was to uh, the adjoining state of Odisha, today it's called Odisha, uh, and in Odisha, uh, the most uh, important pilgrimage place is the city of Puri, the Jagannath temple. And uh, Holy Mother uh, went there in January of 1889. And uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna had wanted to visit Jagannath temple, but he could not. So Holy Mother took with her a picture of Sri Ramakrishna folded in a piece of cloth. And when she went before the, the deity there, there are actually three, um, uh, then she took out that picture. Okay. And uh, Jagannath, of course, is also very famous for the Ratha Yatra, which we spoke about uh, last week. Um, we will move on. We will now uh, talk of her, you can say the third pilgrimage. This is 1890, March 1890. She visited uh, the state of Bihar, um, two uh, cities, Gaya and Bodh Gaya. They are very close to each other. As we saw last week, Gaya, uh, um, Sri Ramakrishna refused to go there because uh, his father uh, was in Gaya when he was conceived. So Sri Ramakrishna thought that if he went to Gaya, he could never return. But he did instruct Holy Mother 
that please go to Gaya and give this what is known as Pindadan, the offering to ancestors on my behalf. So Holy Mother did um, do that, Gaya. And Bodh Gaya um, is a very famous uh, Buddhist pilgrimage because this is where Buddha attained enlightenment. So um, in Bodh Gaya, I will just read a couple of lines of uh, Holy Mother's prayer in Bodh Gaya. So this is page 180. Uh, After performing the ritual to Vishnu in Gaya, she visited Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha attained enlightenment. When Holy Mother saw the wealthy monastery in Bodh Gaya, the pitiable condition of the master's disciples came to her mind. You have to remember that um, when, um, after the Mahasamadhi of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, when the um, young um, disciples, they wanted to form this spiritual community, it was very challenging times. Um, uh, Financial, of course, pressure from family, so uh, we, we read um, that many days the, these, um, these young uh, initiates, they went begging for arms and they didn't get any arms. So there were many nights where they had to go without food. So extremely challenging situation. So that's where the background is. When Holy Mother saw the wealthy monastery in Bodh Gaya, the pitiable condition of the master's disciples came to her mind. She tearfully prayed, Master, my children do not have a good place to stay. They do not have sufficient food to eat and they roam from door to door begging. I wish they could have a monastery like this. And Swami Chetanananda writes in the next sentence, her prayer was answered in 1898 when Swamiji established Belur Mutt after returning from the West. So, um, a very important prayer in Bodh Gaya. Moving along, so now, this is uh, her pilgrimage to South India. Um, and this is much, much later. Uh, this is 1911. Uh, in the meantime, she did visit again Banaras, but we will, uh, we will skip that. And... Uh, um, her uh, pilgrimage to South India in 1911, we have to keep in mind a couple of things. One is that Holy Mother did not speak any language other than Bengali. And in the southern part of India, the states of what at that time were Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and Kerala, uh, very few people, if at all, speak Hindi, uh, speak Bengali. So there was this um, this challenge all the time. And Holy Mother indeed said uh, to one of her uh, disciples that whenever I meet people, they ask, they say two things: mantram and upadesham, and uh, which means mantra means, of course, the the holy name and Upadesham, you can say loosely translated as advice. So uh, when Holy Mother uh, expressed an inclination to visit South India, Brahmananda Maharaj wrote to uh, Ramakrishna Nanda Maharaj, Shashi Maharaj, who was at that time in Madras. And Shashi Maharaj, he left no stone unturned. He worked tirelessly for uh, Holy Mother's pilgrimage. So much so that after this got over, Shashi Maharaj had a very severe bout of tuberculosis and he went to Kolkata basically to die. Okay? So, um, so this pilgrimage is not only uh, very important from the perspective of Holy Mother, but also from, from Shashi Maharaj's perspective. And uh, for about one month or so, um, in February of 1911, Holy Mother stayed in a place which is just across the road, opposite the today's um, Madras uh, temple, the Ramakrishna Mission Mutt in Chennai, just across this road. It used to be called Sundar Vilas. And uh, if you go to the Madras, I mean, uh, Madras was the old name. Today we call it Chennai. So if you go to the Chennai or Madras 
Ramakrishna Math, there is, you can still see the site. Of course, this temple wasn't there. This was built much later. But almost every day, Holy Mother came to this uh, Math. And so it's very, very uh, um, Jagrata from a devotee's perspective. So from Madras, uh, they went to, uh, the, you can say the pilgrimage kind of started. And uh, if you go on a pilgrimage to um, important temples, then you cannot miss the city of Madurai. Madurai is the uh, famous city. It's called the city of a thousand temples. And uh, as you can imagine, just by the moniker, it's dotted with temples all around. Uh, if you just go to the city, even if you don't visit kind of any temple, you will see the influence. I mean, it's really a temple city by all practical means. So um, uh, there is one temple, of course, it's a city of thousand temples, but there is one temple which... Uh, is just amazing in its beauty. And that's the Meenakshi temple. And uh, Holy Mother did visit that. And uh, in uh, temples in southern India, uh, the, the architecture is such that when you go to the front gate, it's called the Gopuram, it's very intricately carved um, stories or characters. So, uh, this, this Gopuram happens to be extremely uh, aesthetic. Um, so I just borrowed these couple of these pictures. As you can see, uh, just imagine this whole, uh, the, the, the kind of structure in the background intricately carved like this. So it's, it's visually so pleasing. Okay. So then... We go to, um, from Madurai, the party went to Rameshwaram. Rameshwaram happens to be uh, across the, the Park Strait, okay? So, in those days, they had to go to Mandapam, and from Mandapam, they took a ferry. Today, if you go, you most likely will take a train, and... Uh, the Indian Railways uh, maintains that this train ride from Mandapam to Rameshwaram is one of the most beautiful train rides in India. Okay? So every time they poll, uh, this makes it to the top five, top ten consistently. So uh, all I'm suggesting is if you go to Rameshwaram, this ride itself will be a uh, very um, aesthetic part of the, uh, the, the trip. Okay. And Rameshwaram, the temple, um, again uh, famous for that southern India architecture, but this temple is mainly famous for its long corridors. It's, uh, many people say this temple does have the longest corridor. Okay. So you can get a, a, a glimpse of that. Uh, here. Now, um, this is, of course, uh, 1911, so uh, Swamiji's fame has traveled uh, extensively. Um, in, in Rameshwaram, the, this temple complex uh, happened to be under what is known as the Raja of Ramnad. The Raja of Ramnad was a very big devotee of Swami, Swamiji. And so, uh, when he came to know that uh, Swamiji's gurus, I mean, Swamiji's guru, in a way, is coming, he kind of um, um, gave carte blanche. I mean, there are some um, restrictions. Uh, there were some restrictions at that time of women uh, getting into the what is known as the sanctum sanctorum, the garbhagriha of the temple. But Raja of Ramana told the priests absolutely no restrictions like that. And uh, um, so let us just read page 348, uh, a very interesting incident that happened at this Rameshwaram temple, 348.
All right. Holy Mother and her party stayed at Rameshwaram for three nights. And Holy Mother worshipped the Lord every day. She also, attend the she also attended the Vesper service and watched the lighted festival image sitting in a palanquin. Palanquin is basically two wooden planks uh, with, uh, with the space in between with, where the uh, devotee sits and it is carried on the shoulders of these palanquin bearers. Um, sitting in a palanquin and being worshipped with music and dance. On the third day of her visit, she performed a special worship following ancient traditions and li listened to a recital of the glory of Rameshwara from the old scriptures. She also fed the priests and presented a water pot to each of them. The Raja of Ramnad had given orders to his officers to open the royal treasury for Holy Mother and offer her anything she asked for. The Holy Mother later recalled. So this is Holy Mother's version. Ah, Shashi. Shashi means Swami Ramakrishna Nanda. Ah, Shashi arranged my worship of Lord Rameshwaram by supplying 108 gold bale leaves. So this is, of course, a Shiva temple. So Shiva is offered with bale, bilwa. Um, and uh, this uh, Shashi Maharaj had procured for the Holy Mother 108 gold bale leaves. When the Raja of Ramnad heard that I had come to Rameshwaram, he ordered his minister to show me the treasury of the temple. And if I liked to have anything, that it should be immediately presented to me. <laughs> I could not think of anything. At last I said, I don't need anything. Shashi is supplying everything we need. Again, thinking that they might be heard, I said, well, if Radhu, Radhu means uh, her uh, niece who was uh, very close to the Holy Mother. And in fact, uh, it was, you can say, a ploy of uh, Thakur Sri Ramakrishna to uh, have the situation in such a way that Holy Mother became the guardian of Radhu. And that was how it brought her down to the earthly plane. So Radhu used to be with her all the time and also to this pilgrimage. Again, thinking that they might be heard, I said, well, if Radhu needs anything, she may have it. Then I told Radhu that she could have anything she wanted. But then immediately the Holy Mother had a reservation. And she says, my heart began to palpitate seeing those precious diamonds and jewels. I fervently prayed to the master that Radhu might not ask for any of these. Radhu looked at those treasures and said, What shall I take from here? I don't require these things. I have lost my pencil. You may buy one for me. At this, I heaved a sigh of relief. After the tour, I bought a two-pice pencil for her from a roadside shop. <laughs> So, um, now, uh, Rameshwaram and Vrindavan, we, which we talked about a little earlier, you can consider them to be the bookends, okay? What, what do I mean by that? Well, in Vrindavan, as we said, this is Braj Bhumi, Krishna's uh, Leela. So, in Vrindavan, uh, Golab Ma heard uh, uh, somebody was suggesting so she was holy mother was in a in a very ecstatic mood and somebody suggested the name of radha and she holy mother i guess inadvertently she said indeed i am radha okay so in vrindavan she kind of disclosed her real identity indeed i am radha and in rameshwaram while taking a dip uh, outside the temple um, somebody asked her, well, Holy Mother, how did you see this place? And she again inadvertently said, well, it looks just like the way it was when Sita was here. So the two bookends in the sense that two times she disclosed her real identity of Radha and Sita. Okay. So from Rameshwaram, we come to 
Bangalore or Bengaluru today as it is called Vishwanath city I mean Vishwanath means our Vishwanath and uh, um, this is the place where uh, we have you can say two very important events incidents one was that again as I have said um, Holy Mother could not really converse with the devotees because she did not know anything other than Bengali and these devotees did not know Bengali. So the, the backdrop is that she is coming to this uh, mutt uh, from, uh, from another place and the devotees are all kind of lined up and they are waiting patiently for her and uh, when she comes in she kind of makes this gesture which is giving of this boon you can say and so these people who are kind of congregated they are waiting for her holy mother comes they are silent holy mother is silent and then about 15 minutes pass and then holy mother feels very bad that she cannot really converse with them. So Swami Vishuddhananda was there accompanying her. So she tells to Swami Vishuddhananda in Bengali, I am so sorry, I can't uh, communicate with them. Please express uh, my apology. So Swami Vishuddhananda then translates that. And then the devotee said, no, 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 this is perfectly fine. We have no problem of communication. So even though there was no language spoken. There was no problem in communication. Okay, it's a very important incident, and um, we are reminded of uh, Adi Shankaracharya's that famous Dakshinamurti Stotram, where he says, "Gurostu maunam vyakhyanam shishyastu chinna samshaya." So the guru speaks in silence, and yet all the doubts of the uh, disciples are removed. So this is a perfect example of that shloka. And then the other incident, again very famous, is that uh, as Vishwanath can tell you much better than I can, there is kind of a hillock in, 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 in the backdrop of this picture. Okay, So Holy Mother went up the hillock and Swami Ramakrishna Nanda on seeing this and when he was told about this, he rushed and said, in Bengali, Maki Parbot Bashini Hoichin, that means, has the mother become uh, the consort of Shiva? Parvat Bashini is uh, an epithet given to Parvati. So, Maki Parbot Bashini Hoichin. And then he recited this uh, shloka that we uh, sing every day after the Arati Sarva Mangalye, Sarva Mangala Mangalye. So, again, a very important event in. In, in her divine act. Okay, so from uh, Bangalore, we now come to the second part, you can say, where these are sites which became famous because of Holy Mother's association. And of course, what can be more important than her birthplace of Joy Rambati? Uh, in the left, you can see her original cottage. And when you go to Joy Rambati, um, very close to this uh, Ramakrishna Mission complex, uh, just um, maybe one quarter of a mile is the Simhavahini temple, which existed even at the time of the Holy Mother. And when you read Holy Mother's biography, you read of that famous incident when she was extremely sick with dysentery and um, was extremely dehydrated and... Uh, Somebody suggested, well, go to this temple. So she went to the temple and then this uh, deity of Simhavahini, she kind of, uh, you can say, saved the Holy Mother. So very important pilgrimage site. And from Joy Rambati, we go to Kamarpukur. Kamarpukur, of course, is famous for being uh, Sri Ramakrishna's birthplace. But Holy Mother also stayed in Kamarpukur for an extended period of time. And uh, this was, you can say, her most challenging time because what happened is uh, Sri Ramakrishna had said to Holy Mother that, uh, um, well, after my passing away, you stay in Kamarpukur um, 
uh, and uh, Sri Ramakrishna had managed to save some 500 or 600 rupees and the interest of that 5 rupees per month uh, would sustain you. That was Sri Ramakrishna's uh, kind of, um, you can say, arrangements. Uh, but you can imagine uh, Holy Mother being a widow at that time, uh, 1880s, 90s, um, uh, with very little money. So uh, her most challenging time, if I may say so, was at when she was living in Kamarpukur. Uh, some people like um, Master Mahashai, they used to send her some money occasionally, but still uh, very challenging times. But in Kamarpukur, we all, this is also a, a, a place where we saw a form of the Holy Mother which we never ever saw again. And that is, the backdrop to that is, there was a devotee of Thakur, his name was Harish. Harish um, uh, had some domestic problems with his wife and so his wife, uh, I mean stories differ, but for his wife, she went to some tantra people and they kind of played some something on Harish. Harish basically became insane, okay. so. So he went to Kamar Pukur and uh, to meet Holy Mother and uh, one day Holy Mother was in her house. She had just come from a neighbor's house and Hari started to chase her. And you can imagine this is uh, kind of, Kamar Pukur is a very sparsely populated village. So Holy Mother's shouts didn't really help much. And she ran to the barn and they circled the barn, but Harish would just not let, uh, I mean, let go of this chasing her. So uh, ultimately, Holy Mother then took the form of what is a form of Kali known as Bogola. She kind of held Harish and pinned him down and then put her knee on the chest of Harish and thrashed him, slapped him right and left. And that is what uh, kind of saved her. So a very important event because, as I said, this Bogola, which is a slayer of demon form of Kali. Uh, I mean, when we talk of Holy Mother, we usually uh, talk of purity and good nature and uh, uh, her very refined way of talking. But this was a form which also she did display. So then from Kamar Pukur, we go to uh, the place uh, where she spent a good amount of time. Uh, you can say about 14-15 uh, years, of course not uninterrupted, but um, early 1870s to 1886, uh, 1885. Uh, and um, the place which is most associated with the Holy Mother is the top right known as the Nahabot, which is where she stayed. And, uh, and if you go to Nahabot, and if you go to that room where she stayed, you cannot but be awestruck as how is it possible for somebody to stay in just that one room. It's a very odd shaped and octagon shaped room, very small room. And not only did Holy Mother stay, it was not just Holy Mother. Lakshmi, for most of the time, used to stay with her. And whenever any woman devotee had to stay the night, that is where they would stay. So, Holy Mother, Lakshmi and other devotees and um, uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to have fish for his meals. So, for basically his um, sensitive stomach, they required a kind of a special kind of fish which used to be put alive in the pots which were hanging from the ceiling. So, you can just imagine, uh, and Holy Mother of course was a vegetarian, so um, how she lived, it's really a marvel and uh, you can only, I think, get some idea if you look at that room. I mean, I had read about Nahabod many, many times, but until I went there, I couldn't really comprehend. 
All right, so moving along because we are uh, running out of time, we go to the house which is today part of the Ramakrishna mission in Belur. This is Nilambur Mukherjee's garden house which was, you can say, the mutt for a, a short period of time before they permanently moved to Belur Mott. And uh, uh, Holy Mother did stay in this house um, for, for a decent amount of time. Um, the most famous incident that is associated with her stay is this uh, in July, August of 1893, which is known as the Panchatapa. So, uh, when she went to Banaras the first time in 1886, uh, there was a Nepalese uh, devotee. She said uh, she saw Holy Mother was so depressed and then she said, e my Panchatapakar, that means please conduct this austerity of Panchatapa. And that was in, in Holy Mother's mind and it did um, come back to her a couple of times as well. But in 1893, she decided to go ahead with this uh, Panchatapa in this house on the roof. So what is Panchatapa? Panchatapa means uh, austerity associated with five fires. Okay. So this is the roof. If you can imagine four cow dung cake fires. I mean cow dung cake is a very uh, widely used means of energy or fire. So four cow dung cakes at four corners and this blazing sun. This is July uh, which is the peak of summer, you can say. And Holy Mother herself uh, recounts that she, early morning she would take a bath in the Ganges, which is just uh, on the, I mean, this house is on the banks of the Ganges. And then she would sit from dawn to dusk. Okay? And you can imagine these four fires around you and then this sun above. And she did this for seven days. So tremendous austerity. And uh, um, Holy Mother did say once to a questioner that she did this because she wanted to show how to lead an austere life so that it would set an example. Okay. So, uh, Nilambur Mukherjee's garden house. Uh, I'll, I'll just skip because we are running short of time. I'll come to Kashipur, of course, we know uh, Thakur's um, Antim Leela, Anta Leela, Holy Mother also uh, did stay in this house with Thakur. And this is where, as you know, um, okay, I'll just skip that because <laughs> anyway. So let's come to uh, Balaram Mundir again, uh, a nondescript house which today has become a big pilgrimage site for followers of Sri Ramakrishna and the Holy Mother. Holy Mother stayed in this house for a very long time, a number of visits. Um, and then we come to uh, the house. So this place known as Udbodhan is also known in Bengali as Mayarbari, that means Holy Mother's house. And um, uh, Swami Sardananda, he realized that Holy Mother was kind of living like an itinerant from here to there to there. Um, very, um, didn't look good. So he decided to, you can say, arrange for a permanent place in Kolkata for the Holy Mother. And in fact, he took to writing the Leela Prasanga basically to get funds for this house. Okay, so, so he took a loan and he said, I will repay the loan by writing the Leela Prasanga, which the, then the, the, the royalty from it, the sales of, from it would then go to pay the loan. So uh, very important place because there are so many Leelas associated with this place. Uh, I'll just mention two uh, for lack of time. One is, um, and as I said, Holy Mother initiated thousands of people and uh, most of her initiations were done in this place, okay? So, a uh, young boy comes and he says, Mother, I want to be initiated. And Holy Mother says, okay, come tomorrow. And, um, and there were some formalities, take a bath and all that. So, the, 
the boy comes, not boy, a young uh, a youth uh, comes and takes initiation, goes back home and he cannot just let go of these evil lustful thoughts in his mind. So he fights them, he fights them, no avail. So he, he gives up. So he comes back the next day to Udbodhan, comes to the Holy Mother and says, I, I took this initiation, but there are these lustful thoughts that I just cannot let go. I fought to the best of my ability. Uh, I give up, so I return this mantra to you. And then he starts leaving. Holy Mother at this time, as you know, she had arthritis, so she couldn't really walk very well. So the, just, you can just envision the situation. The, the youth, he starts going out of the house. Holy Mother, with her arthritic knee, she kind of walks fast, catches hold of this guy. And she says, uh, and she says, look at me. And then he says, well, if lustful thoughts come to your mind, if these lustful thoughts arise, do not fear. That's the first sentence. Second sentence, face them. Third sentence, think of me. So with this, this youth, he comes back to his house and he finds, lo and behold, all his evil lustful thoughts, they have vanished. So, he then decides to join the Ramakrishna order. He goes to Belur Mott and Swami Brahmananda. Now, in those days, in the early days, uh, if you went to uh, the Ramakrishna mission and you said you wanted to be a sannyasi, you had to wait a long time for this initiation uh, because Brahmananda Maharaj was very strict. And can you imagine with this person, Brahmananda Maharaj says, okay, uh, come tomorrow, I'll initiate you. So he could see through, I mean, this pure heart. So then uh, he is initiated and then this person goes to Hardwar for his sadhana. So much so that when Brahmananda Maharaj went to Hardwar, he, he kind of asked for him. He said, this person whom I initiated is now doing sadhana. I want to see him. And that person then later became Swami Tarakeshwarananda, very well-known monk of the Ramakrishna order. So this is one incident and uh, let me mention one more. Um, so if you look at this house, when you enter this house, as you enter the house to the left, there is a very small room, which is where Saradananda Maharaj used to stay. And then you went up a flight of stairs and went to Holy Mother's room. So, in, when somebody was initiated, it was very common that the person would get initiated and then Holy Mother would say, now go to Sharat, Saradananda Maharaj, and Sharat will so, show you how to do the Japa. I mean, there are these ways where you know, on your fingers you can count or on the rosary you can count. So, there are some techniques. And so, with this person also, Holy Mother said, okay, you have the mantra, now go to Sharat and Sharat will then tell you about the rest. So, the person comes down to Sharat Maharaj and says, Holy Mother gave me this mantra and uh, asked me to see you. Sharat Maharaj says, okay, could you just tell me this mantra again? Doesn't sound right. So, the person kind of recites, says, doesn't sound right. I think you made some mistake. You may not have heard Holy Mother correctly. Please go back and tell Holy Mother that Sharat Maharaj sent me because this mantra doesn't look right. So the person goes up, tells Holy Mother this. Holy Mother says, what is the mantra? So this person recites. He said, yeah, this is fine. Go back to Sharat. Comes back, comes down. Again tells Sharat that Holy, Mara, Holy Mother said, this is fine. Sharat Maharaj still is not convinced. He says, could you go back please one more time? And uh, just because I don't feel comfortable. So... Again, this thing happens. Holy Mother says, I told you this is the mantra. Now, go back to Sharat. So, the third time, Sharat Maharaj, of course, now he has, he, he cannot do anything more. But it kind of haunts him. Sharat Maharaj writes, much, much later, many years later, Holy Mother has passed away. Much later, in a very rare Tantra books, book, he finds that mantra. 
So you can imagine uh, how highly evolved Holy Mother was. As uh, Turiyananda Maharaj said, her consciousness doesn't come down below the throat level. I mean, we all want to, we try our best to raise it to whatever, but in her case, never came down below the throat level. Anyway, so, um, uh, and, and Udbodhan also is the place where Holy Mother breathed her last. Um, and we all um, know this prayer. So what happened is just two or three days before her last day, um, she was extremely sick, could not get out of the bed. She saw a lady who's famously known as Annapurna's mother. Um, and then she called that lady. And she gave this final piece of advice, which is what you can say we paraphrase uh, when we say grace, the, the prayer that we say after Brahmarpanam, that is, you can say, the, pretty much the advice that Holy Mother gave to Annapurna's mother. So with that, um, let us um, pray to Holy Mother that when we envision these uh, events and incidents, that can help us in our spiritual journey. We will meditate for 30 seconds and then if you have questions, I'll, I'll try to answer them. Questions? Yes. Holy Mother was born in 1853. She um, passed in uh, 1920. So, um, 67 years. Yes. There were many temples that you uh, saw in the pilgrimage. Do each of these temples have a period where RT is performed? So there's an auditory sense in the whole city, different chants or different... Uh, yes. Yes, almost. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But th there are th different aratis, um, but yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, in fact, when you go to Banaras or Hardwar, especially in the evening time, some people say it's cacophonous, but I don't think so. Because, you see, these are very closely spaced temples. There is Ganga Arati happening on the Ganga. Each temple, whichever is the presiding deity or whichever is the organization, they have their own arti. But if you are inside the temple complex, then of course you, you don't hear all this. But it is, yes, visual plus auditory. Yes, absolutely. No, Yogananda Swami didn't come to the West. Yogananda Swami is, where is Yogananda? This person. So, Yogananda Swami is the first uh, of um, Sri Ramakrishna's or Holy Mother's disciples to pass away. He passed away even before Swami Vivekananda, very young. But he didn't come to the West. The Swamis who came to the West are Sarada, of course, Vivekananda, then uh, Sardananda, Abhedananda, Trigunatitananda, and Turiyananda. Turiyananda, Turiyananda, Turiyananda. There, there, there. Four Swamis. And uh, on her first trip to Banaras, uh, Swami Abhedananda accompanied her. So, Swami Abhedananda is the one who composed this hymn, which we sing, Prakritim Paramam, that's very famous hymn. He's the one who composed it. Yes, yes. Paramahamsa Yogananda is a different lineage. Uh, Lahiri Mahashoy, Yukteswar Giri, that is the, what is known as the Kriya Yoga. Okay, thank you so much. Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum 
पाद पद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुह